Go now if you're going to go. Good morning, everyone. I hope that you can join us. I'm Todd McCracken. I'm the president of the National Small Business Association, and we are uh, really pleased to uh, bring you an update on our lawsuit challenging the uh, legality of the uh, uh, Corporate Transparency Act, which can impose a whole new raft of, of, of obligations and liabilities on the small business community, uniquely uh, uh, on the small business community. Um, and uh, we want to bring up to where things stand, what we have done so far, uh, and what the path forward looks like. And to do that, we've we've put together, uh, I think, a really nice panel of folks who uh, can speak to to the lawsuit itself. The, the uh, uh, Tom Blay, who's one of the attorneys that we're working with, uh, to to present our case to the courts, uh, is with us today. And he'll talk about some of the legalities and and the ins and outs of our lawsuit. Uh, Tim Terry is with us, and he's a, one of the leading experts on the impact of the Corporate Transparency Act uh, on the business community. Uh, he, he is uh, uh, active in the, uh, a number of organizations that are, that, are, that are looking at this pretty prominently, and, and he's going to talk about some of the substance of the rule and why it's so difficult uh, for small businesses to handle, what some of the obligations actually are, uh, and why the rule doesn't really make a lot of sense. So uh, I'm going to kick things off. Uh, again, thanks for being with us. Uh, uh, if you're not aware, I hope you are somewhat aware uh, already, but the Corporate Transparency Act is a law that was passed by the, uh, uh, by the Congress in, in January of, of, of 2021, uh, at the very end of the Trump administration, the last few days, actually, uh, as part of a much larger bill. Uh, and it, and um, it, under the guise of trying to, uh, they say, uh, uh, end um, uh, uh, all kinds of financial crimes, uh, money laundering, et cetera, uh, they want to create a database that every individual that owns an entity is a, quote, beneficial owner, which is a new definition, by the way. You can more about that in a few minutes. Uh, for every every small company with fewer than 20 employees, basically, there's a few other ends and outs, but basically every company with fewer than 20 people has to comply with this, uh, send in ownership information, which includes personally identifiable information, driver's license numbers, uh, address, all, all sorts of, of unique information uh, for these individuals. Keep it up to date uh, on an ongoing basis uh, in this federal database that we're not quite sure uh, how exactly it will be used or how it might be leaked. Uh, and if, and uh, the, the penalties for failure to comply with this or to keep this up to date are, are pretty significant. Uh, it's almost like they presume that anyone who doesn't comply is a, is a, is a, is a, is a financial criminal. Um, so, but despite these burdens, we really don't think that the law is even legal. So we have challenged it in court. Uh, for a variety of reasons that Tom Lee will get into a little bit. We think that it's not constitutional uh, to, uh, to presume to collect uh, criminal-like uh, information uh, and for folks who uh, have not been charged with a crime. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of other uh, issues as well that we have with it. So um, we have filed suit in, uh, in federal court. Uh, that happened earlier, uh, uh, actually late last year, that's earlier this year, late last year actually. And we, uh, there's been, some significant uh, dialogue in the courts, and we're we're awaiting the next steps from the court. Uh, but Tom Lee will talk about all of that uh, in, in in just a minute. So at the end of all of this, we will have some time for your Q and A uh, for Q and A from you all. We ask you as you do that to, to put that into the chat. Uh, Molly Day, who is uh, the VP for Communications for MSBA, will be moderating, and she's going to. Uh, um, uh, uh, basically look through some of those questions and, and, and moderate the Q&A at the end. So first up is going to be Tom Lee, uh, who, is, who is leading the lawsuit uh, in federal court. Then we'll hear from, from uh, uh, Tim Terry about, about some of the substantive problems with uh, the Corporate Transparency Act. Uh, and then Brian Rudin is going to talk to us a little bit about a coalition building, what's happening legislatively, uh, 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 other organizations that have been partnering with us on this, and so forth. And then at the end, we'll have time for Q&A, as I said. So with no further ado, let's get into some of the substance. And I'm going to turn things over to, to Tom. Uh, Tom, thanks for being here. Uh, and maybe you can give us a little bit of a, a, 
update on where things stand, and what some of the key legal points we've been making in court are. Bob? Thank you, Todd. Um, and I'm very um, honored to be here to talk to you. Um, my name is Thomas Lee. I'm special counsel at Hughes Hubbard and Reed. I'm a constitutional lawyer. And so we filed a constitutional challenge to the CTA on November 15th in federal district court in the Northern District of Alabama. The plaintiffs were NSBA and NSBA member Isaac Winkles, who owns a small business in Northern Alabama within the district. The defendants were uh, the director of the Financial Crimes Intelligence Network. Uh, I, I call them the CIA of finance. Uh, the CIA's days over. So FinCEN is really their successor entity. Uh, and so they're a part of the Department of the Treasury. The acting director's name is a man named Himamali Das. So we're suing him, Janet Yellen, and the Department of the Treasury. Those are the defendants. Why did we pick the Northern District of Alabama? Well, we think that's a relatively hospitable forum because um, they're they're likely to to the trial court and the appellate court. This is probably going to go to the Supreme Court. Um, are are likely to be receptive to the type of federalism and individual rights or libertarian type arguments that we're going to be making. So what has happened in the lawsuit? We filed the complaint on November 15th. The defendants were served by the end of December. Um, we got in touch. Uh, so I should I should add that our local counsel is my law school classmate, John Nyman, who's former solicitor general of Alabama, one of the top appellate lawyers in, in Alabama. So we have a loaded loaded team. And so we reached out to the Department of Justice and we managed to negotiate a streamlined expedited briefing schedule. Because if you look at the chronology, the statute comes into effect for new companies on January 1st. So, so we said like, look, we'd really like to get this litigation uh, done quickly so that the Supreme Court gets a chance to sign off. And the government um, was amenable to that. And so what we negotiated and which the trial judge accepted was an expedited briefing schedule where each side had 80 pages of briefing and we requested oral argument. So the briefing schedule was, we were to file our opening brief on February 15th, which we did. And we were allotted 40 pages for that opening salvo. The government was allowed to file 60 pages on March 29th, right? So we filed 40, they filed 60. Then we got to file an opposition, 40 pages on May 2nd, and the government gets the last word brief, uh, 20 pages, so that's 80 total. And so that is all done. The briefing was completed a month ago. We requested oral argument, but we have not yet heard from the judge. Our local counsel informs us that it's likely that the judge will grant an oral hearing in a case like this. I should say that Practices in federal courts across the country differ, and in this part of the country, it seems to be not so typical as it is in New York, where I'm currently located, to, to grant oral arguments. But we're expecting the judge to give us an oral argument and notify us by that uh, uh, by order about that sometime in July, right? So the hope is we'll get a ruling by by August, and and if the ruling is not good for us. We're going to file an expedited appeal to the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. If the ruling is, is good for us, there's no doubt the U.S. government will appeal right away. What happens at the 11th Circuit? If we win at the 11th Circuit, the U.S. government will almost certainly appeal and the Supreme Court will almost certainly grant. If we lose at the 11th Circuit, if we are a two-time loser, that is, if we lost at the district court, we lost at the 11th Circuit, we will still file to the Supreme Court but there's a chance that the Supreme Court might not take the case. So it's very important that we win at least once at one of the lower levels to maximize the chances of the Supreme Court taking the case. Now, if the government is a two-time loser, the Supreme Court will definitely take the case because at risk is the constitutionality of statute that Congress has passed. So that's the procedural aspects of it. So I'm gonna to touch really quickly on the, the legal issues. The legal issues and... and um, <clears throat> You know, they really fall into three baskets, and I'm going to talk about two of the baskets primarily. And the two baskets are we're making two types of arguments. Number one, Congress does not have the power under the United States Constitution to enact this statute because entity formation is something that under our Constitution, the states do. And this statute, yes. In the government's briefing, they say, well, this isn't really about entity formation, right? This is not an entity formation statute. Alabama can have whatever law it wants 
to govern entity formation. We just want this sort of a piggyback statute that says you have to turn over uh, certain um, personal information to the feds after you form the entity under state laws. I mean, come on, who's going to buy that? I mean, that's excessive formalism. <laughs> You're trying to backdoor something that the Constitution doesn't permit you to do. Now, the government's arguments are going to focus on, they have to identify something in the Constitution that gives them the power to enact the statute. And the primary battle is going to be about the Commerce Clause, because the Commerce Clause gives Congress the power to regulate interstate, foreign, and tribal commerce. And so our argument there is, look, this is an entity formation reporting statute. An entity formation itself is not a commercial activity. It's a ministerial activity. Setting up the entity doesn't involve engaging in any interstate commerce, doesn't involve in, in, in going into commerce. In fact, many entities are established that don't do anything. And so uh, this is beyond the power of Congress. Um, so, so those are the sort of constitutional congressional power arguments. Um, we, in our briefing, we focused on the Commerce Clause because that's the most important one. The government raised a couple of other powers, including the taxing power, right? The, there's a provision in the Constitution that gives the federal government the power to tax, and this is, um, the statute is valid under the taxing power. Our rejoinder to that is, this is not a taxing or a tax fraud statute. It could have been, but it's an anti-money laundering law enforcement statute. So nothing in the statute tells us that it's a taxing statute. And so that's not a valid argument. The second basket of arguments are individual rights arguments. And so the, base, the basic idea there is whether it's under the Fourth Amendment, the Fifth Amendment, or the First Amendment. Forcing entities to turn over the personal information of their beneficial owners and applicants to the federal government particularly to the financial CIA, to put into a database that state law enforcement, federal law enforcement, and intelligence and security agencies, and even foreign law enforcement, security, and intelligence agencies may access without any present suspicion of wrongdoing or criminal activity violates the Fourth Amendment right against unre unreasonable search and seizure, rights against compelled self-incrimination, and also forces the entities to turn over information when they don't want to, right? And so those are the nature of the different individual rights arguments. There's one other key individual rights argument, which I'm going to, um, which Tim will talk about, and that's the idea of unconstitutional basis. And the idea there is when you enact a statute that has criminal consequences for people, you have to make sure that the key terms are clear enough that, and the, and the Supreme Court's actual words are ordinary people can understand them. And another problem is if it's not that kind of clear language, then the enforcement authorities have broad discretion to enforce it against whom they want. And so we say that the term beneficial owner and the way the government defines it is unconstitutionally vague because no ordinary person is going to be able to figure that out. And in order to figure that out, it's going to cost them a lot of money and can have consulting um, to consult lawyers and so forth. So that's the that's the um, individual rights vagueness argument, right? So we're making that as well. I said that there are three baskets of issues. There's a third issue. This is an issue that we didn't bring up because it's not an issue that's good for us. Um, the government, we weren't surprised, but we were surprised at the extent to which the government devoted assets to briefing this issue. It's standing, and standing is not a merits issue. Standing is the idea that, look, whatever you can say about the constitutionality of the statute, these plaintiffs have not suffered a concrete enough injury to litigate this claim in federal court, right? And so the idea there is, Plaintiff Winkles and NSBA members, you turn over personal information to the government all the time. And so there's no concrete injury by having the CTA force you to turn this over information to FinCEN. And our argument is, yeah, you might turn over information to get a driver's license. You might turn over information to get a passport. But the reality is you're doing it to get a passport. You're doing it to get a driver's license. You're not giving the feds this information to put in this massive database that the Chinese can access if they have some memorandum of understanding with the DOJ because they're worried about um, um, people, political opponents of the, the regime that are expatriating money and buying real estate in Florida or whatever, right? So in any event, 
that's the that's the argument that we're going to make against standing. Um, the government devoted a lot of resources. If we lose on standing, it means that the merits arguments don't get um, considered at all, right? And so, so in our briefing, we pushed back very hard, making the arguments along the lines of what I've just said um, on that standing issue. And that's all I have. I'll turn it over to Tim. Over. Great. Thanks, Tom. So uh, pivoting off of Tom's issue, and this is, I'm going to do something that's more um, uh, focused on the practical aspects of compliance with the statute, which which underscores why the vagueness argument is so strong. So the uh, requirement under the statute is to report the beneficial owners of entities. And beneficial owner is defined by the statute as uh, anyone who directly or indirectly through any contract arrangement, understanding, relationship, or otherwise, one, exercises substantial control over the entity, or two, owns or controls not less than 25% of the ownership interests of the entity. The second prong of that, the owns or controls uh, ownership interests, that's what we all traditionally and typically think of business ownership. It's who owns the equity. Equity often brings both the financial benefits and the power to make decisions with respect to the entity. The first prong is where all the problems are. Um, so first we have to look at um, you know, what substantial control means. And because they added in the predicate language that it's you know, directly or indirectly through any contract arrangement, understanding relationship or otherwise, you were getting outside how we would, as business lawyers and business owners, we would typically think of control in the context of the governance documents of the entity we're talking about. Who has, who sits on the board? Who has the control over the LLC entrance? Who gets to vote? Who gets to appoint uh, people to executive positions or managers or things of that nature? But the, the first prong requires all of us to go outside the governance documents and look at all the other relationships that we have that this entity has with the world writ large. So that's the first problem of this um, definition is that it goes way outside the traditional understanding of what ownership means inside a business and creates this, this whole new construct out of whole cloth that's very difficult to understand. So we start with this concept of substantial control. You have to look outside your governance documents and look at all other relationships that you have, that the entity has with other people. Um, let's go to the next slide. So this is the definition of substantial control in the final rule. And this is verbatim. This is the actual definition. And it, it suggests that an individual exercises substantial control um, if the individual serves as a senior officer, has authority over appointment and removal, those are sort of the typical, you know, internal governance document controlled issues. C is the key thing. So this is the third indicator, as Vincent calls it. Anyone who directs, determines, or has substantial influence over important decisions regarding the company. And then they list, you know, what those substantial decisions or important decisions can be and remind and be mindful that this list is not exhaustive. This is just a snapshot of some of the things, but the, um, the FinCEN is very clear that none of the lists they include in the final rule are, are complete, that this is just demonstrative of what the types of things that you need to be looking at. So the key ones on this are the item three, which is major expenditures or investments, the occurrence of debt, the approval of budgets. Um, you also have compensation schemes. And then in D, you have the catch-all or any other form of substantial control that's not really well-defined. It's just a catch-all. In case they forgot to list something here, they get you in D. Um, so now we have a rule that talks about substantial control, which embodies this concept of substantial influence over important decisions. So now we have to figure out what does substantial influence mean? So let's go to the next slide. So um, the, actually we skipped a slide here. Go back one and one more. Um, I think we're missing a slide. 
but let me um there yeah the final rule no okay let me talk to this uh we're missing the slide so um the the final rule incl includes some explanatory um information which basically says that an individual may directly or indirectly exercise substantial control over reporting company through this is another list through board representation ownership of voting rights rights associated with any financing arrangement or interest in the company so if you have an operating line of credit and your bank or financial counterparty has some rights to veto decisions or limit what you can do with your assets that potentially makes them a um a um a substantial or a beneficial owner of your company even though it's a third party arrangement um and then uh, also any other contract arrangement understanding a relationship that's a repeat of the statutory language and the final rule in the explanatory comments um the Fenton says the final rule also retains the quote unquote substantial influence language in the third indicator, which we talked about before, because Fenton envisions situations in which individuals may not have the power to direct or determine important decisions made by the reporting company, but may play a significant role in the decision making process and outcomes. Okay, so now we have these three concepts we have substantial control. We have substantial influence and we have significant role. And mind you, none of these are you, do you have to have actual decision making authority? So they've taken a, a, an amorphous concept of substantial control, which could have been very simple and just, you know, power to make decisions, which is what I think most of us would think. And they've added these additional concepts and trying to explain it and uh, make it uh, understandable. Of, of substantial influence and significant role. Um, let's go back one slide, please. So when we boil it all down, in order to determine who has, who is a beneficial owner under this statute as clarified by the final rule, reporting companies will have to review every contract arrangement, understanding relationship or otherwise to determine when an individual has substantial influence or plays a significant role in important decisions concerning the business. Mind you, those individuals do not have to have the power to direct or determine or benefit from those important decisions. And if you get any of this wrong and you misreport, you might be a felon. That's the consequence of, of failing to comply properly. So let's look at some practical applications of this. Uh, move to the next slide, please. So here are some situations where it's a question whether this the the party who's not a traditional owner of the business, as we think about it, so has no economic interest in the business um, or ownership of equity in the business, may be a beneficial owner nonetheless. So we have a third party IT consultant who provides advice to a small business on their IT systems, right? Most small businesses are focused on other things, their primary business, they're not experts in IT and they need help because we're all under attack in that space. So they enter into a contract with an IT consultant. The IT consultant comes in, they design the entire system, they give you a budget and equipment list and guide you through the entire process of how to set up your systems and your equipment, and they service that and they provide updates. They may provide ongoing security assistance uh, for those systems um, and things of that nature. And the question is, you know, that's a, a third party consultant that has a contract. Remember, the statute says any contract uh, that gives them an, a, a significant role in decision in important decisions of the company, even though they don't make the decisions or have any financial benefit from the decisions. So the question is, is that IT consultant a beneficial owner? They might be. Um, is, is Fenson intending to capture those kind of relationships? Not clear. Uh, and I'll get into that in a second. Um, another example is a parent, uh, whether who's a very sophisticated business or financial person um, whose uh, son or daughter owns a business. It may be one that was passed down 
uh, from generation to generation that's not as sophisticated or as new to the business and co is consulting with the parent on a regular basis, even though the parent has no official role in the business, um, is that parent who's just, you know, out of love and family relationships or whatever is giving free advice to the, the son or daughter to help them grow their business and be successful in life in general. Is that parent a beneficial owner? They might be because they play a significant role in the decision making. Uh, another area to think about is a mortgage or real estate broker who helps place a loan or find uh, your primary business location. Um, they, they brokers often play a pivotal or fundamental role in helping find space. And it's, and a lot of times these relationships are, it could be friends, it could be more professional, but it also could be a parent who's a broker or a brother or sister who's a broker, um, who helps in that context, gives a break on the price, or maybe charges twice as much, who knows, but, you know, are those arm's length relationships? Um, in most cases, they're not. Um, it, where a family member is involved. So they are, they clearly play a significant role in a key asset of the company, your, your operating location. Um, is, does that make them a beneficial owner? It might. Um, there is uh, one, one discussion of, of third party services in the final rule explanatory comment, but it's solely in the context of tax advice and legal advice. And the language, this is the verbatim language, it says, FinCEN does not envision that the performance of ordinary arm's length advisory or other third party professional services to a reporting company would provide an individual with the power to direct or determine or have substantial influence over important decisions. Okay, so they carve out tax accountants and lawyers or maybe general CPA advice and lawyers, but that doesn't really help in the context of all the other third party consulting or contracting contractual services that you might need to help run your business. Um, let's move to the next slide, see where we end up here. Okay, so I'll just wrap it up real brief, briefly. So, you know, the, con the statute in and of itself, the way it's drafted is very complex. It doesn't rely on traditional notions of ownership. The final rule, goes even further down the, that path of making it even more complicated. It doesn't clarify, it just over, it complicates it even more and goes even further afield of the traditional notions of beneficial ownership. And so what we end up with is a very complex, hard to understand statute and rule that most small business owners will have no idea how to comply with because it's just so far afield of what we all typically think of as ownership in America. Um, and that's ultimately one of the fundamental failings, constitutional failings of this statute and the proposed rule. And that's precisely one of the, act, the components of it that we're attacking and hopefully will be successful. Uh, there's a lot more um, inside the statute and the rule, depending on the particular circumstances. We're just dealing with one piece of it here. Um, it's a very important piece of it, but there's additional areas of focus of the statute and the final rule that are equally complicated, equally vague, um, and cre just create a, a huge compliance headache for anyone who's gonna be subject to uh, these reporting requirements. So with that, um, we'll change focus and I'll turn it over to Brian Reardon, who can talk about uh, what we're doing in addition to the litigation to help uh, put this thing behind us. Thanks, Tim. Um, I, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to the group. Um, I always always learn new things about the CTA and the challenge it, challenges it presents every time Tim speaks. So that was, that was super helpful. It, uh, it reminded me that I, I went up to Chicago to uh, speak to a, a group of business owners about the CTA, about the NSBA's lawsuit and some of our other Hill activities. And before I spoke, there were so two lawyers who were focused on the enforcement side of things. And they spent 45 minutes going through all the nuances of what these businesses were going to have to do and not do under the CTA. And you could see the business owners just getting increasingly angrier and angrier as, as they went on, because as Tim made clear, 
you know, the CTA itself, when it went past Congress, was not a well thought out piece of legislation. But what's coming out of FinCEN and Treasury in terms of the final and the proposed rules is extraordinarily broad and unworkable. And that's part of our message that we're taking up to the Hill. Um, it really is something that, you know, you, you just sit back and you think, okay, how if I were a business owner, how am I going to possibly comply with all of this and do all the things that I have to do as a business owner? So um, in terms of the uh, business community and our coalition in opposition, as you can imagine, this has been a long-term challenge for the business community. We've been fighting this for literally two decades um, now, obviously, with the bill being passed back in 2021 and being implemented, um, we're taking what I might call a comprehensive approach to uh, defeating this effort or at least making it a, a better and more workable version. Uh, that includes uh, supporting the lawsuit, the NSBA lawsuit that you guys are engaged in. And it, it's been extraordinarily helpful to have that lawsuit, both in terms of hopefully it's successful, but also it gives us a hook to go up to the Hill and start talking to people about uh, the challenges of the CTA and what, what's going to come if the lawsuit is unsuccessful, if our other advocacy efforts are unsuccessful. Um, in terms of the lawsuit, um, well, we'll go back. I haven't, I haven't gotten there yet. Um, we, we did uh, a letter of support uh, for the NSBA suit. Uh, we had over 40 groups sign on, a broad coalition of folks. You can see some of the more prominent uh, trade associations that have been supportive there on the, on the slide. Um, I think one of the key things here is that you know, the business opposition is not industry specific, and that's something we're trying to emphasize up on the Hill that you've got contractors and wholesalers and manufacturers and professional organizations, um, real estate folks. This is a broad-based coalition that represents pretty much the entire American economy that is supporting the suit and opposing the implementation of uh, the CTA. Um, in addition to having that letter, having the suit out there, we're actively meeting with key offices uh, to make the case for delay or repeal. Um, coalition members are having fly-ins. Spring is a popular time, so we've had the roofers and the beer wholesalers were recently in town. They're all up there taking this message and talking about both the lawsuit and the challenge that the CTA poses to their members to the Hill. We're doing lots of emails and educational forums and you know, uh, presentations like what we're doing here. Uh, op-eds, we've got a number of op-eds in the works that should be coming out here in the next couple of weeks. So in terms of the lawsuit, you know, fingers crossed that it's supportive. Uh, we're also focused on trying to get the uh, legislators uh, up on the Hill to uh, take this uh, seriously and to take action. Um, and the good news is that there is growing awareness of uh, what's coming. And we've been trying to highlight to them the political backlash that is gonna take place if you know, starting next year, literally millions of small business owners get notices from this agency that nobody's ever heard of, demanding all their personal information and the personal information of this broad you know, group of, of folks that Tim just defined. So there is growing awareness of the impending rollout. A couple of pieces of evidence of that. Uh, Patrick McHenry, who's the uh, chair of the House Financial Services Committee, uh, recently penned a letter to FinCEN asking them just how prepared they were, asking very specific questions about where they were in the process and how they were possibly going to be prepared to take in these millions and millions of reports starting January of next year. Uh, he's also introduced legislation that effectively says that unless the Secretary of Treasury can certify that FinCEN is ready to make this a go, then the, uh, the implementation would be delayed until that certification is, is available. So that's helpful. Um, there is going to be a hearing. They're planning a hearing in July in the House Financial Services, one of the subcommittees. Um, my guess is that the focus of that hearing will be on the lack of preparedness that the FinCEN has and the, the you know, sort of the case for delaying implementation. Um, our goal is to make it also an opportunity to make the case for a repeal or a significant rewrite of the CTA. And so we're actively meeting with members of the committees and in leadership to highlight those concerns. One of the educational challenges that we have is that lots of folks you know, that, that are here now 
weren't around back in 2020 and when all this stuff was litigated out. So we have a significant educational challenge. For example, half of the members of the subcommittee that is, is going to have this hearing in the July work period, they weren't here. So this may be the first time that they've ever done a significant uh, look into the CTA and what's, what its implica implications are. So um, very active on that front. Um, our goal uh, in the coming months is to uh, find a sponsor and get legislation to scrap the CTA altogether. That in addition to the lawsuit will give the business community a nice target to rally around. There's also gonna be an effort uh, to look at the provisions of the CTA and make them better targeted, effectively risk adjust the, the, the reporting requirements so the, the folks who are more likely to be engaged in these illicit uh, behaviors are the ones that actually have to do the reporting. As you can imagine, there's it's impossible to make the case that you know requiring millions and millions of small business owners to provide this information has any targeting whatsoever. It's just the shotgun approach. And I think that, you know, it's... it's uh, Tom and Tim made clear there's a very good uh, argument to make that it's it's wholly unconstitutional, um, which uh, brings us, I guess, back to the lawsuit. Um, you know, we we are continue to highlight the the the, the NSBA's role in this and the fact that the lawsuit is pending. That we're hoping to get a decision before uh, anybody has to report anything. Um, and, uh, you know, in the meantime, we're using it as, as the hook to go up and educate people just how bad this bill is. So with that, I'll turn it back to uh, Todd and, and happy to take any questions that folks have. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks to thanks to Brian and Tom and Tim for the, I think, some really great information that I think people can uh, can use and digest. Uh, so now we're time to, it's time to sort of answer some questions. I think there have been a few asked in the chat. Uh, if you have questions, uh, please continue to put them in the chat, and then I'm going to turn it to, to Molly Day to kind of moderate. She's been looking at the chat and seeing what questions uh, we, we can pose. So, Molly, what uh, what are some questions that uh, our panel can help answer? Yeah, thanks, Todd. I know that there have been some questions about revenue um, that uh, Tom and Tim have both uh, addressed in the chat. Um, I did get an emailed question to me, so let me ask this, and then I'll go back and look at the chat and see what other questions are coming in. Um, what is the likelihood of Congress passing something? I know, Brian, you touched on this a bit, but uh, you know, maybe maybe the House or the Senate passes a bill. Is, is there what's the likelihood of something actually happening to overturn the CTA? Um, I think in the short term, um, it's, it's highly unlikely that we'll get anything other than maybe a, a delay. And I think delay is is definitely a possibility, mm -hmm. um, something that uh, Congress may take a look at uh, later this fall. Certainly, you know, as the evidence mounts that the uh, FinCEN is just not ready. And again, you know, when we were in Chicago, one of the lawyers actually was a treasury attorney who worked on the rules that, you know, FinCEN promulgated. Um, so he had an inside sort of view as to how those rules were put together. He was of the mind that everything would get delayed. So um, it's entirely possible that we do see delay. I don't think we can rely on it. As far as a broader rewrite or repeal, um, I think you're going to need to actually see, you know, the implementation, have the backlash from the business community. And if that backlash is as sizable as I think it's going to be, then I think there's the chance for them to revisit the CTA and rewrite it or repeal it. Yeah, and that's Thanks. why the litigation is so important, is if we can knock it out in this lawsuit, that'll reset the table. It'll force Congress to go back to square one. Even if even if even if we went at the district court or appellate court, and before it becomes final, it will hopefully get an injunction on the implementation of the CTA, and I think that'll completely reset the table. And that's for that's the one of the primary reasons that we filed the suit in the first place was just to stop the CTA, force Congress to go back to square one, and figure out a better approach. Okay. We just got a question from uh, Disha who asks: Is it possible that business coaches and consultants? Will be considered beneficial owners under the CTA? Absolutely. Anybody who has a substantial influence or significant role, even though they don't actually make decisions or benefit from them, is under the way that the rules written and the statutes written are technically a beneficial owner. Do I think they are trying to capture that scenario? Um, probably not, but what they are trying to capture are these, you know, are the are the crooks and criminals 
who disguise their role inside organizations who actually are pulling the trigger and in, in, in getting the benefit of these things. And the problem is that the only way they could go after that nefarious activity was to be overly broad in in how they describe the the influence and roles that people play. And in doing so, they're they're bringing in all these other people that are probably unintended consequences. But unintended co consequences are often unconstitutional. So um, you know that's what we're attacking. No, and just to to add to what Tim just said. Um... Besides being a lawyer, I've taught constitutional law for, for 25 years now, and, and this happens often. So the drafters of the statute and the rule, they have a particular problem in mind. And it's it's sort of like, I don't know if you've watched The Sopranos, but it's, it's sort of these criminal organizations where they don't own anything, but they actually have significant influence. So, so they wrote the rule with that problem in mind, and this happens all the time. They, they don't anticipate all of the innocent people like you who, who are going to have to struggle with a rule written for that particular problem because the language is written in a way that it could plausibly apply to you. Yeah. And I'll just give you a personal example. You know, I've organized businesses for family members um, on numerous occasions um, and uh, help friends with their businesses and legal issues that they have from time to time. And, um, you know, these are all, you know, I don't charge anything. I do it because they're friends and family. And so, you know, even though the FinCEN provided that explanatory comment that they don't, they're not trying to capture um, third party professional services that are arm's length in nature, none of what I've done with my friends and family is arm, arm's length, right? It's not, I'm bar, it's, I'm, they're not paying market rates. They're, you know, I don't even have a, a retainer agreement in most cases or anything like that so it's decidedly not arm's length am i a beneficial owner of all of my friends and family's businesses even though i have no interest in any of it um probably i mean the way it's written would i be comfortable advising them not to report me as a beneficial owner i don't know you know, it's 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 a quandary that I'm going to have to fa face squarely and talk to my friends and family that I've helped and say, hey, this is an issue. You know, if you don't report me, you could be a felon. Thanks for that. Um, I did get another question emailed. Um, and if, if you prefer to do that, you can send it to Molly or I'm sorry, mday at nsba.biz. Um, the question is, what kind of recourse is built into the law if a small business gets hit with a fine? Can we dispute it? Is there any kind of timeline assigned to that dispute and how does that work? There's no, in the statute, their fines can be assessed up to $10,000 per violation um, or punished by two years in jail. Um, and it's the two years in jail that makes, makes it a felony offense potentially. There's no, there's nothing else specifically written about timing you know how they do it would just be sort, sort of normal enforcement mechanisms of the government that would come into play um you know if they're going to impose a fine you obviously anytime the, the government makes a charge against you you have the ability to defend yourself um so it's not just it's not um you know a unilateral power but you know technical violations are technical violations so if you miss somebody can they technically come after you and potentially technically put you in jail? Yes. That's why this is such an egregious statute because 90, I mean, pick the number 95, 99% of the people who have to report under the statute are law abiding citizens. They're not trying to money, launder money. They're not engaged in illicit financial transactions. They're just trying to operate a business. Yet the vast majority of the compliance burden falls on law-abiding citizens. And the other thing, the reality is the crooks and criminals are not going to report accurate information. They're going to continue to lie, cheat, and steal. So the beneficial ownership information reported by the crooks and criminals is all going to be bogus. And this was borne out in the UK where they have a similar registry called the Company House Registry, where they found just rampant fraud and abuse in the information reported by um, criminal enterprises. Um, and they basically put real people on their forms at, and threw law enforcement off their trail um, and took 
you know, a couple of years to track down this straw person who was just a legitimate business person. They just grabbed their name at random and information and loaded it into their their reporting. And, um, you know, it took them a couple of years and, you know, probably scared the life out of the guy that that was used this way. Um, and they finally realized that he was just an innocent bystander and knew nothing about this criminal enterprise. And, and then law enforcement had to go back to square one. So that's the other absurdity of the statute is only law abiding people are going to, or really dumb criminals are going to report their actual information. Uh, nobody really, nobody, if, if criminals are forming entities to engage in their illicit activities, they're probably not dumb criminals. They're doing it for a reason. They're doing it because they're trying to hide. They're more sophisticated and, and they're trying to go after the big, you know, Russian oligarchs and other, you know, big money people that are trying to hide it in the United States. Um, so they're not, they're not the dummies. They're the smart people and they're not going to report, you know, their accurate information under this statute. I do get another question come in. Are any industries exempt? Yeah. So, so. Um, I see that question, Natasha, and I saw a question from Gina about Spanish companies. So I'll do that. Um, was that withdrawn? Okay, I don't know. Um, so, so yes, certain industries are exempt. You'd have to list at the look at the list of twenty four companies. But for example, utilities, banks, financial institutions, investment advisors. Um, uh, Basically, yeah. regulated industries, right. businesses in regulated industries are exempt. Publicly traded companies are exempt. Large, larger companies are exempt. Um, so that so that exemption is the five million in revenue and twenty full time employees. Um, if you're under the and that has to be in the entity itself, the same entity. It can't be you have a holding company. You have a couple entities underneath. Um, generating revenue, maybe you have a management company where all your employees are. Um, if the management company is not generating 5 million in revenues and that's where all your employees are, um, then that has to be reported. And then your, your asset holding company, um, you know, may have revenue, but no employees, or it's an investment vehicle of some sort, you know, that has no employees that doesn't qualify for that 5 million and 20 employee um, exemption. So it's really, well, after you parse through all of the exemptions in the statute, the people that are left are small businesses. Uh, so anyone with under five million in gross receipts and less than full twenty full time uh, employees, um, and that's that's the vast majority of the business community in America. Um, and they're also the least likely people to be abusing the system. Um, so. It, it's just silly how it it worked through um, the legislative process, but that's where we are. Um, there, there's also sort of a catch-all exception, the 24th exception that says that you, you know the Secretary of the Treasury could write in an exemption, um, but that requires concurrence of the Attorney General and um, the Secretary of Homeland Security. Uh, um, the question about um, from Gina, I see it now. If a U.S. based American consultant works with a Spanish company based in Spain, could this law force the Spanish company to report the American consultant as a beneficial owner? Um, the answer is no. Uh, it only applies to, to U.S. entities and not Spanish entities, but it's sort of a, a double edged sword there because Spain is part of the EU and the EU has similar laws. So the Spanish company would presumably have to adhere to its, its own beneficial owner rules, right? And so so in some sense, um, this is a more complicated situation because I, I mean, and I'm, I'm assuming the US-based consultant is operating in their own name that they haven't set up an LLC to, to run the consultancy. I mean, you could you can imagine how complicated all this is gonna be, right? And there is a situation. So if the Spanish company has a US affiliate like, or they qualify directly to do business in yeah. the US in one or more states, then they would be a reporting company. That's um, right. So it's, it's if there's a if you if you're organized under a state law or qualified to do business under state law, then that you're covered by the statute. Right. So Gina, if it is an LLC, if it's like a Delaware LLC, then then that LLC is covered by the statute. So you'd have to report that. But if it's an American consultant who's working on a 
sort of a contract salary basis in, in their own name, then they wouldn't have to, right? But if it's an LLC, yeah, it you have to. Yeah, it does not apply to individuals, it applies to entities. Great, well, I'm not seeing any other questions. So Todd, why don't I turn it back over to you for any final thoughts everybody has, and then we'll wrap it up, give people a couple minutes back in their day. Right. Well, again, thank you all for joining us. As you can see, this is an ongoing uh, battle. It's not just about the lawsuit. The lawsuit is a really important piece of it, but it is really important for, for us all to stay really engaged. And there are lots of things you can do to help. I continue to find when I talk to small business owners around the country, how little knowledge there is that this is coming. And so whatever you can do to connect with your local business groups, chambers of commerce, uh, to, to, to let them know what is happening, uh, that, that is tremendously important. You can go to the NSBA's website. Uh, we have a whole raft of really useful information on the CTA that you can get to from our front page, uh, nsba.biz. Uh, uh, with just about everything you might need to know about the CTA and about the lawsuit itself uh, that you can share with others and, and ask them to go look at. Uh, would love for you to talk to your legislators about it. As, as Brian mentioned before, so many members of Congress were not here when this was passed. They don't know this even happened. Um, and so they don't feel defensive about it, right? So they might be willing to take some action to help us. Uh, so that's really important to stay in touch with them and let them know uh, what's going on. Um, also, as this lawsuit rolls forward, we're going to get lots of requests from the media uh, to say, okay, how it's really impacting small companies. Can I talk to a business owner? This could affect. Uh, so if, if that's something that uh, you think you have a good story to tell, you're willing to talk to the media, uh, please reach out to, to Molly Day, so let's call. She can reach her at mday at nsba.biz uh, via email uh, and let her know that you're, you would uh, be a resource for us in the media. That would be tremendously helpful. Um, so with that, uh, I, we just encourage you to stay stay tuned, uh, stay in touch as things uh, progress, as we get more news about the lawsuit or other legislative developments, we'll let everyone know. Uh, and we really appreciate you being here. And, and thanks very much to our excellent panelist speakers today. Uh, thank you all for, for being here and sharing all this on your wisdom. Thanks, Todd. Thanks a bunch. And uh, we'll let you have your morning back, everybody. Have a great one.